Okay, hello, good morning, still. Uh, well, my name is Eunice Mercado. I work for the Mexican uh, Council for Science and Technology, which is basically the NSF for the United States. Uh, we are, we've been working through a open science policy over the last three years, I guess. And I would like to share with you the experience coming from a funder, funding institution, the main funding institution in my country, actually. Uh, in Mexico, the, percent, the distribution of uh, funding for science and technology is approximately 70% coming from uh, the council, and the other 30% comes from other federal funds or private uh, funding. So uh, thinking about an open science policy as the main funder was very attractive for uh, the, the, the council. So what, I was, what I'm trying to share with you is the experience designing this policy and what happened after a few years of implementation, which as you can imagine is very different from the original plan. So basically the outline is uh, to share with you the timeline of the policy, some of the inputs from the designing process, the implementation plan, and some results and the challenges. So how was it? Uh, Mexican's open science policy has started because we've got a reform into the science and technology law in 2014. Basically, it had, it, it added a chapter for open access, but it was more rep a repository driven strategy because there was not, there was, it had no any component regarding, regarding incentives or regarding publication um, practices. So it was more a strategy thinking to retrieve whatever was outside. Uh, by November, we had the journal guidelines with ER, I mean IR, it's institutional repositories, and NR is national repositories. So as you can see, uh, everything from that year was based or was towards a repository uh, strategy. So we created these general guidelines for institutional repositories that basically set up the design of the platforms and the technical guidelines for these platforms that basically said that we as a, as a funder are going, will provide some funding for some institutions to create these platforms and we, are, we had to create an aggregator which is the national repository. Um, well, uh, in May, <coughs> some, okay, in between we have like the design period and the implementation period. From November 2015 to May 2016, we've decided to make a difference, um, different strategy to take different mm, approaches for each uh, researchers, research institutions. In Mexico, we have two different sets of different research institutions, basically. The first one is a 27 research centers that fi financially depends from Conacyt and they have a vocation more like only to make research. Not, they are not really teaching oriented. And the other ones are the universities, public, private, and they may have their own funding or may request or participate in one of our funding programs. So we decided to start with the first ones that basically are like very close uh, from us and we have some, some um, sort of, possibilities to come to mandate uh, and to intervene on their on the way they are creating science so we decided to mandate them to, to provide them the platforms interacting with the national repository and to help them to implement these strategies in the institutions and the other strategy was to fund the rest of the system to to set to launch a call for applications call for projects for institutional repositories and so we can fund them and they will have to develop their own platforms their own strategies and we are only going we'll have to evaluate so uh, well just a few uh, more comments 
In June 2017, we realized that open access was a little bit uh, short in the means that we were looking for. So we tried and we decided to uh, integrate another six programs in order to think a, and to design a more broad policy, such as an open science policy. So how it is composed or which is its composition. The Open Science Policy basically uh, includes six programs. The first one is the journals. Conacyt also funds or provides funding for uh, editors or publishing, uh, academic publishing efforts. Uh, Conrecit, which is basically a consortium to, uh, to pay for subscriptions. Uh, the repositories program. Public communication of science program that is basically trying to make more accessible most of the uh, research, uh, research uh, information we got from papers or data sets and the integrated system for science and technology information that is basically all the data we, produ we as a council produce regarding uh, managing science, like how many scholarships we provide, uh, how many researchers do we have and money and where the money is going. And the last one was a broadband connectivity program that basically is trying to provide broadband connectivity to all of the research institutions, which it's not something that should take for granted because at least in Mexico it's not as it should be. So uh, how it was? This policy was a users oriented policy at the beginning. Why? Because we made a survey in 2015 and basically the results said that everything was kind of perfect. And it's important to mention who did we, uh, what, which was our target population. We have in Mexico this system that is the National Researcher System that basically is a, um, it's an evaluation uh, program but not necessarily. You, you can apply as a researcher and it's going, to, it's going to provide you two things. First, it's going to tell you in which, if you are accepted, it's going to tell you in which level you are. It comes from the first one, which is candidate. And there are for, uh, first, second, and third level. There are three levels um, up, um, above uh, candidates. And it also, well, it's a, thing, a matter of prestige, but it's also a matter of rewards because we provide them uh, some economic reward. It goes above uh, $15,000 and yearly for the upper level, which must, with for which for most of the or Mexican researchers is basically <coughs> half of their incomes. So you have a very economic incentive to be there and you have a very in economic and prestige incentives. Most of the research institutions uh, requires to be in this system to seek a, or to take to be taking into account for a tenure position. Uh, well, so we asked. Well, now by, by 2015 we have 23 above 23,000 members uh, according to that database, but only 23 and a little bit less than the original number were alive and had an email. So. <laughs> We send it to them, the, the survey, and the level of response was really good. We have a 50, over 50% 50 of response with completed questionnaires, above 11,000 11, questionnaires. Control variables, SNE level, which level they are, gender affiliation, if they are private, public universities, government, the area, and the years within the program. So, one of, the questionnaire was about 15 questions, 20 questions, but uh, the main questions or the most relevant for this talk are these ones. The first one, are you fami familiar with any open access initiative? Uh, yes, yeah, the answer was yes, no, and if yes, please tell me which ones. I don't think that which ones are very relevant, but what is interesting here is that most of them, 73%, said that they were familiar with any, op with at least one open access initiative. Second, which is your position regarding open access to science and, and technology, technology research results? Uh, in favor, neutral, and against. The global, 
by disciplines. Globally, they are in favor. Uh, 11, a, a little bit more than 11% it's neutral. And only 0.5% is against. From those who, who said that they were against, we asked them. As a researcher and author, which are the main obstacles you consider determined not to share your work within an open access repository? By area. So we got like these results. Copyright and publishing policies was the main uh, obstacle, just followed by lack of awareness of the benefits and incentives to, to participate. Complex processes and complicated interaction with platforms, not identified yet, and others. So if you have this scenario, you may think that they are very aware, that they are very interested, but they are not really, they don't have as much information, uh, information as, as they would to participate within these initiatives. So this is why, under this scenario, we decided to create an users-oriented platform, I uh, mean policy. So, we implemented, as I mentioned, two strategies, two incentives. For those institutions who depend fun financially of Conacyt, we implemented a centralized model, 25, 27 repositories uh, provided by us. Um, we also provide a five-year covered storage uh, plan, maintenance, improvements, uh, <coughs> trainings, up, actually, well, workshops, anything to help them and to the administrators to help uh, to deal with this platform. And for the rest, which is like the 90% of the research institutions in the country, we implemented a decentralized model. This model where you can apply for a project and you can get uh, some money to create to develop your own strategy. It's about, we offered them about $50,000 per project uh, yearly. And we've had three calls for applications, not only, yeah, we've received about 15, I mean 50 projects and we've funded about 45 or something. Okay, and we only provide them one workshop, like the launch, the very begin at the very beginning of the project, we present them the main concepts, the main uh, technical uh, things to have in mind. And we realized something. The first ones, I'm having trouble with this. Okay. The first, okay. Yeah, maybe I, okay, maybe I just, I'm gonna hold it. I'm gonna hold it, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Uh, for the first one, we realized that the incentive was very tricky because they were not really excited about us because th th it was more a compliance thing for them. They were not really collaborating. They were most trying to do all the checking boxes. And for the rest, was something about prestige and recognition because they say, hey, you're going to sit fund me this project and I have this, and, and I given there are there are not a lot of institutions with these platforms they feel they felt they were uh, significantly ad advancing in this um, discussion so we had more it was easier for us to work with the second uh, group of institutions than with the first ones also so some results for years and over 15 million of dollars later we have 70, uh, 72 open access repositories, 30 to come, and over 33,000 information resources, and over a million of visits in the national repository. Basically, our, uh, the information resources are master thesis, articles, data sets, well, not data sets, well, book, uh, doctoral thesis, and some book chapters, books, proceedings, uh, and by area, the most collaborative ones are social science, just after maths and physics. Main challenges, I'm about to finish. Okay, we, re we realized it's not a technological problem, but a research practice challenges. No matter, no matter if you are the, funding, the main funding institution in your context, 
you may not be your policies may not be as attractive as you think they would be. It's not a build it and they'll come. So we have to face the role of incentives. Okay. And at this point, I would like to talk about something about political science that is called hard power and soft power. Basically, hard power is whatever is mandatory and it's, it's, it's also to give money as a means of persuasion. Or it's soft power, that is to reshape uh, preferences of others through appeal and attraction and to seem that you are enabling something good to happen. Well, for the first one, we realized that we thought it was not necessary because the scenario was very positive. Uh, so we decided to go with the second one, but we realized that it's, it's not going quite well because over 33,000 information resources in three years, we had a projection uh, that was above 500,000 information resources by this time. So we are not even close from the 10%. So the first for us as a funder, the soft power option, it might be good. You may be looking for, if you are looking for a long-term results uh, initiative, but it may take a long time to get there. The hard one might be also useful, but you should be very um, careful where to implement it. As a regulator, which is the hard po uh, power model, we think that we should rethink the SNE system and the scholarship program requirements. As we evaluate the SNEs, as we provide them a reward for the work they are doing, we should, we should start thinking on the recognition of other research products, such as uh, data sets or other contributions. And for the scholarship programs, we should be thinking or um, at least trying to help the students to get familiar with these initiatives, at least with ours, the national repository. And as an enabler, which is the soft power strategy, we think that it's, uh, it takes a lot of dissemination. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big dissemination effort what is needed if you are thinking to if you are if you are thinking to appeal and attract people sometimes as a governmental uh, organization you don't have as much budget or as much time as you would need and also we have to offer better services in terms of citation statistics author identifiers default open licensing and we also know that we are not the best actors in this field. I mean, you have a lot of other, I don't know, private or non-profit institutions doing better and, must and more cool stuff than you. So, you know, you're not going to be the best in that field, but you can enable, or, you can enable uh, to use it or to foster whatever practices you find interesting for them, but let them decide to decide. Um, I think I had a lot of things to say, but the most challenging uh, part of this talk is to make it fun because for most of people, politics is not fun, nor policy. <laughs> so, I would appreciate if you go to the mic. Yes. Uh, yes, well, just as a comment, I, I think I'm a hard policy kind of person. I mean, there's non-profits that are much cooler than you, but you have the money, so I mean, you don't have to be cool. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I, I'll ask to ask you, do, do you have any data on compliance with the open access uh, mandates? Or I mean, how my, what percentage of, uh, of uh, Mexican articles, for example, are in open access? And can't you take that into account in, the, in your evaluation simply? I mean, isn't that the easiest way to, to, to make people comply with it? Yeah, well, the first one, I know it's easier, but it's not that we want to be cool. It's that we know that if you use the hard power model, you'll find, you will find a lot of resistance. I've personally had to talk with several researchers saying that they will sue us if we force them to public everything in open access, because that it's their right to decide where to publish. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and the second one, I just want to make sure that I understood the question, is basically 
what, is, if is, is there any data or any information about how much of the Mexican production is published under open access uh, uh, yeah, efforts? We don't have the number, but we know, because it depends on how you see it. Mexicans not only publish in Mexican journals, they publish in a very open uh, and international journals. Uh, but we have a certain, we are more, more close to uh, ed publishers, editors, editors, Mexican editors, and we know that most of Mexican uh, editors or uh, journal efforts in Mexico are open access. Actually, one of the reforms we've got with this, within this uh, open science policy is that we also provide them funding to improve their publishing uh, capacities. So we are not funding uh, journals who has a subscription model, who have a subscription model. So we know that, but we don't know how or where Mexicans are publishing and the amount of, yeah. Hi. Um, in, in Canada, the tri-agency funders are now in the process of creating this big policy document. And I was wondering, in the course of this project, were similar kinds of big visionary policy documents created? And how did that go? And how did was that used? Were like the different um, stakeholders using that Is it enforced in some way? Why I'm being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> No, I can see. Yeah, okay. No, it's 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 interesting. We are we may not be the only ones now at this point, but we were the first, <laughs> and I know that by the OCDE uh, STI uh, data sets. So uh, interesting. For Mexico, it's sort of easier than for for other countries. This is that's why. I start this talks saying that we are the main funding institution within the country. So basically, as the, our, as Octa Olavo said, we had like a very, uh, a very interesting scenario. However, the, the law, even when it's the most important document on science and technology, it says it's not mandatory. It's if you find it useful. Uh, anyway. We have other documents. This is where the policy talking gets very boring. But we have other other documents like re secondary regulations that allow you to make it more hard power alike. For instance, reviewing the rules of each program and the requirements for each program. What I would say in general is that you should be able to work with both levels in order to Yes, to complain, but also to, to offer options. Because if you are in a more restrictive model, the, restri the resistance will be a very significant um, obstacle from your research community. And you don't want that. I don't need to ask a question. Is it OK if, yeah. if you ask a question sort of yeah, yeah, that's fine. private? Sure. Because we are sort of ran out of time. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay.